Uh, good afternoon, and thank you to all of you who are joining us again for another segment in the Jane Irrigation Training Series. Um, I'm Richard Rastusha, Vice President of Water Management Solutions, and today we're going to be talking about something that's really near and dear to my heart, and that is uh, drip tape placement in cotton. And really, you know, my first job in agriculture was farming cotton in Arizona where I grew up. So um, it's uh, even more particularly interesting to me. And, you know, there's a lot of things about cotton that people really don't know, right? 75% uh, of our currency is, uh, you know, U.S. currency is uh, made from cotton. I think uh, the average American owns seven pairs of jeans that come from cotton. Cotton has a big effect on our lives in more ways than we even realize. And it's a uh, 27 billion plus uh, uh, market in, uh, in the US right now. So a lot, uh, a lot is happening with cotton. Um, and uh, today we're gonna talk about you know, how your drip tape placement affects your yield and your germination really making you more or less profitable depending on if you're doing it right or not. And the person that's gonna be taking us through this journey is uh, one of my favorite presenters and that's uh, Michael Pippen. Um, I really enjoy Michael, I find him uh, fascinating. Uh, he's really able to make agriculture and irrigation interesting. He is uh, oftentimes the smartest guy in the room when it comes to any of this. And uh, what's also really uh, fun about this is he's really had a life of agriculture, really growing up in agriculture, uh, understanding agriculture and working in agriculture to this day. So we're really lucky to have Michael. Michael, thank you for joining us today. Uh, uh, you're out in Florida today, right? That's right, I'm home today. All right, so Michael, one thing I was thinking about um, when I looked at this subject and I said, well, drip tape placement, cotton, is this really limited to only people that are growing cotton or have an interest in cotton? So I wanted to ask you, you know, does drip tape placement matter in other crops too, or is it just cotton? I, I think it matters in basically everything that we do from a, ir a drip irrigation standpoint. Um, I've struggled with, uh, you know, drip tape placement in strawberries in Florida where really sandy soils and the plants are built up on a high bed and um, I've struggled with and watermelons with a really flat bed and you want to plant the watermelon right down the center. So do you put the drip tape on the left side or the right side or both sides? I've struggled with it in pecans with permanent emitter line, you know, four feet from the tree, five feet from the tree, 10 feet both. Um, I think that there are, um, you know, even in landscape applications, we struggle with do I plant a, a couple of punch in emitters around a shrub or do I do a, build a full loop around it with emitter line and tight spacing, lower flows? And so I, I think that there are challenges in trying to understand what to do uh, in almost all crops. And, and really the, the origin of what we're going to talk about today, the original conversation was what we were having with, with a dealer of ours um, a couple of months ago back. And uh, they, they've spent their now the dealer uh, works and all these guys live and were raised in this West Texas area on these cotton farms and have done a lot of work in drip and a lot of work with center pivots and almost everything. And we're talking really more about what are the challenges kind of as this drip market in cotton, you know, it was kind of shooting through the roof and then it's kind of flattened a little bit. And I wouldn't call it a mature market, but we're kind of getting to where you know, maybe the easy acres are done. Maybe that's a way to say it. You know, all the stuff that is a, kind of a no-brainer. Now you're kind of getting into the, the areas where maybe um, people are looking a little bit closer about the pros and cons. And what are the challenges that that um, face uh, a drip irrigation system in this area? And one of them is germination of, uh, of, of, of cotton in the early part of the, of the spring when it's dry out there and trying to get that cotton up and going. And some of the things that these dealer was doing and they see in the market was playing with the spacing of the rows of uh, cotton versus the rows of drip, right? How you do all that kind of stuff. And uh, we were talking through that and we were, you know, it, it, very interesting conversation. I was learning, not talking a whole lot for sure. And um, about two or three weeks after we got to talk about this, there was an article in the Irrigation Today, the, the IA Irrigation Association's kind of quarterly um, ag uh, magazine that they put out. And it described this report that we're going to uh, talk about today. And the report was done by uh, James Bordowski and Joseph Mustaine out at a research station in, in um, kind of west of Lubbock, right? And, and that kind of that, that plains area. And it was done by the ASABE, the Agriculture Association 
um, American Society of Agriculture and Biological Engineers. It's ASABE. Get my acronym straight there. And uh, it was exactly what we're talking about. They're, they're, they were going into this evaluating kind of what they thought was a you know, major hurdle for, for drip in this placement of the drip tape on the cotton. And that, that's kind of what I'm going to do today. I'm really going to um, share or do my best to, to share that the, the findings that they had in this report kind of hit the high spots. And then at the very end, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll definitely share their conclusions and then maybe a few that, that I drew from reading the data and just kind of some of the market that, that, I'm, that um, I've, I've been used to. Yeah, that's, and, that's uh, great. That's actually yeah. very exciting. Uh, and I, I think it's going to be interesting for all of us. So thank you. Yeah, so I wanted to spend just a few minutes, not long, you know, talking in real general terms about cotton. There are kind of two types of cotton we grow in really worldwide, but, but specifically in the U.S. They have the upland cotton and then a Pima cotton. The upland cotton is what we grow the vast majority of. They call that kind of your everyday cotton. It's used in, you know, your everyday things that are in your, your, um, your home. And it really is what has made cotton as a fiber uh, economically viable for the everyday person, right? And then you kind of got this Pima cotton that's really this premium long strands, that long fibers that make it soft and make it strong. And that's kind of the, you know, you get this, you know, really, really good bed sheets or something like that. It would be kind of on the same part as you hear like Egyptian cotton. It's kind of a long fiber fiber type of a cotton. And so uh, that's really definitely kind of an upper tier, not necessarily grown very wise. It's harder to grow and narrower growing season. And there's some research being done in Texas for that. But but most of what we're, gonna, we're growing and what we're going to talk about is this upland variety. Um, and really kind of last summer, if you think from, you know, July of 2019 through kind of June of 2020, there was about 20 million bales of cotton harvested in the U.S., um, I have $7 billion worth of uh, value because that is just right off the farm into the gin, right? So this is not a value added revenue like you were talking about earlier. It's just right out of the farm into, into, the, uh, into, the, into the cotton gin, about $7 billion in value. And the U.S. is the largest exporter. We're not the largest consumer. We're, we're, we're really an exporter of, of cotton, uh, a, lot of way, a lot of it going into uh, to the Asia continent. So um, I think one thing that we, we hear a lot terminology-wise in, in cotton is we talk in terms of bales. Um, it's kind of one of those unique things in some of these ag markets, you know, what in the world is a bale, right? And so if you look there in the bottom left, you can see a forklift picking up kind of three or four bales of cotton at one time. Most people have probably seen a bale of cotton. It's about 480 pounds-ish, um, a little under 500 pounds is what a bale of cotton is, and it'll make about 200 pairs of jeans. And so to kind of start putting those things together, you've got 20 million bales of cotton. That's a lot of blue jeans that you can make, right? And so um, it is a major crop and the commodity crop in the U.S. Um, really kind of to transition over into why we're going to talk about drip and why drip has been important and why, why drip irrigation has, has taken off in this area of the U.S. is the value of cotton. Um, cotton right now is about, let's call it 70 cents a pound is how much the value of cotton is for this upland cotton. Um, besides kind of some market, you know, uptick significantly around 2010, 2011, 2012, some, somewhere in there, uh, cotton is basically the same price per pound to the farmer that it was in the 80s and 90s. Um, you can look at historical pricing on that in like 1980, it was about 60, 64 cents, 60, you know, 70 cents. And of course, that's the market. So it varies up and down throughout the year. 1990s, it was around 80 some odd cents and then, you know, got down below 50 cents right around the 2000s where a lot of cotton shifted out of the southeast. Um, so so um, it really uh, kind of drives home the point that, you know, obviously a lot of costs have gone up significantly. If you even just look at land and equipment. Um, but the dollar revenue is not, so we've got to do more with less, right? It's kind of a theme that we see through a lot of our agriculture commodity commodity crops is how can we do more with, with less inputs. Um, kind of the last historical uh, slide I've got here is, you know, where so where do we grow cotton now, right? Compared, I think a lot of people would say, oh, well, it's southeast, right? Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia, and that is true. If you see the map here, um, the state lines don't show up too great, but this is the Mississippi River Delta, Mississippi River. This is where our farm is, right there kind of in the, in the northeast corner of Louisiana, and we grew a lot of cotton there through, you know, the uh, 20th century. And then we got into that, some of that, you know, 
60, 70, 40 cent cotton in the 2000s. And in, in the simple case is that a lot of us, including our farm, we just didn't have enough acres to, to, to grow cotton. And you've seen some cotton acreage pull out of this, this Mississippi River Delta. Uh, there is a lot grown up through this Georgia area as well. Um, but you can see out here, a lot more is grown in Texas. And about 40% of the cotton that we produce, it comes out of, out of the state of Texas. Uh, the story that I always tell on this is that um, we, for a long time, um, our family were big hunters and we lived here in Louisiana and we had some friends that lived in Roswell, New Mexico over here and they would invite us out to go mule deer hunting. And the first year that I went, we were all through farming, right? It was right around Thanksgiving. We packed up our stuff and we drove west of Dallas and kind of towards Sweetwater and kind of started headed northwest through all this ground that's red right here with the plus 100,000 acres of acre of, of car harvested cotton. And there was two things that came to mind to us. One, how in the world do they grow cotton out here in the middle? Of what We thought it was a desert. It looked like a desert to us. You know, we, it's not, but it, but, it, but it looked like a desert to us. And, and how in the world do they ever get all this cotton picked? It just looked like, I mean, we were done. We were going hunting, and it looked like they haven't even started out there, right? And I think it really kind of boils down to two things. You know, how, how has this area been able to produce cotton and really be the leader in cotton? And I think one is just a very resilient culture, right? People that have, are raised out here have uh, found a way of life. They love that area. I love the area going and visiting and just refuse to give up, right? I think there's part of that in their culture. And then I also think they've been, you know, probably on the forefront, at least in this cotton of, of, of adapting technologies and new growing practices. They, they've had to, right? And, and that's really where, we you know, where this study kind of takes off. The, the, the really, the drivers behind moving, you know, uh, irrigated acres into drip is that the, the, the declining aquifer in this region of the U.S., the Ogallala Aquifer, that most everybody in the irrigation industry has heard about. It runs up from Kansas down through this plains area and is drastically depleted um, uh, over the last, you know, however many years. But, but quite, I mean, it has been depleting for a while and, and really been on the radar. My whole irrigation career, we've been talking about this aquifer depleting. Um, and it's pretty well documented that in season, drip irrigation is more efficient and in general um, it's been proven that you get higher yield, yields from drip irrigated cotton from the in-season irrigation and that's why there's been about 300,000 acres converted from center pivots to drip more efficient more yields life is good so why in the world is it not all drip right that, that you know makes perfect sense more more uh more efficient, more yields, everybody's happy. And, and the, the real thing is that there's obviously always cons to any kind of thing you do. And, and some of it is the initial cost of the system is higher in general than a center pivot. And uh, the other part of it is this germination thing that we're going to talk about, you know, a little bit more in detail uh, from now on. So, how do we get to this report and how do they decide to do this? And uh, in 2011, it was dry. Uh, one thing I want to want to point out here real quickly is this is Lubbock average rainfall. Uh, this kind of Lubbock's kind of the central area of all this high plain. So, but it, it'll drive the point home here. It really dry in November, December, January, February, March, and it starts kind of picking up here in April and May. This is harvest season. Nice to be nice and dry. But as it starts to get in this planting season, you can see it starts ticking up the rainfall. That's what we want to happen. Doesn't always happen that way. In 2011 out at this research station, uh, it was super dry. And, and, the, and the planting dates were getting later and later in May and into June, and it was like June 15th. And it kind of was the point of no return. They had to do something. So instead of planting like they had done traditionally, which I'll show you in a second, they decided to go into what they call a skip row planting. So traditionally, you've got plants that are spaced evenly this is showing 40 inch spacing. You will see some 30 inch space plants out there, but in general 40s. 40 inch space plants and a drip tape in between each row. This is the traditional way that it was done primarily in drip when we started doing this. Uh, what they decided to do just because they needed to do something was like, let's plant just a row right on top of the drippers. Let's see if we can get this stuff to germinate reasonable thing they didn't have much else going on so they decided to do that and what happened was the yields weren't bad and so the, the the wheels started turning they're like okay well 
how long should we wait? Should we keep on waiting for these rainfalls and do our traditional thing? Or should we plant more based on the climate, soil conditions, and, you know, as far as temperature wise, and just plant right on top of each row? What happens, right? This yield was not bad and we didn't even mean to. What if we plant it on time this way? Would that work? And so they kind of developed this hypothesis. Could we just plant on top of those drip tapes? And even though we don't have as many plants out there, if we do that on time, would that not be just as good, maybe better than what we've been doing this whole time? That was kind of the hypothesis of this of this uh, this presentation of this report, and and this is kind of the five things that you see out in Texas. The five things that's not a great way to describe it. The five placement strategies of of drip tape on cotton. This would be traditional that we described, equal spacing plants with a drip tape on very basically every other row centered. What we see primarily now is if every row where you've got evenly spaced plants and evenly spaced drip lines below it. This is what we primarily see now. We're a little bit of a mix, but I would say this is what we primarily see. What they tried on that trial was this skip row, trying to put the plant right on top of the dripper. This is what we were talking about with our dealer. Like, okay, let's take these old 80s and try to get the best of both worlds, right? So we've got an 80 inch space dripper but you got 50 in between. You're kind of clustering those plants closer to the drip. So you're trying to say, okay, let's, mm. let's go with a wider tape spacing, but keep the plants a little bit closer. And these are kind of the five strategies that they wanted to look at that you will see throughout this, this region. And then you kind of have this skip row plus, which is really they just come in here and put a plant in between and you know, you know, it's on its own, right? It's kind of far from the dripper. And here you'll see it you know, uh, uh, in, in their trial where you've got this traditional in this gap the 3050, you can see this wide middle right here. Skip row, nothing in the middle, but drippers right on the plant. Skip row plus, you know, uh, definitely a plant in the middle that's not getting a whole lot of love from the irrigation system. And then this every other row over here, you kind of see this, you know, the the, the cotton balls after they they uh, they've opened, and you can see the differences kind of through them in this year, 2016. And this is really the the, the five that they that they um, five placements that they that they changed. And um, I guess I'll go back real quick and you say, well, well, this looks, why, why would you do it every, why would you just do it every other row? And there's every row and there is cost consideration to, to, to doing that. Obviously you can say, well, there's twice as much drip tape, but it doesn't cost twice as much. And uh, from a design standpoint, you say, okay, we've got two drip row, two, two drip tapes versus four. Why, why would it not be double the cost? And well, if you're, you're putting out the same amount of water, we're putting out an inch of water a week. Let's just take that as an easy number. Uh, whether you do that with two or four drippers or a hundred drippers, whatever you do that with drip lines, you still have the same gallons you got to pump. So your pump's the same size, your filter's the same size, your mainline pipe is the same size. What does vary is kind of probably how you zone it off. You know, um, also you know there's spacing of your drippers. Um, but one, one scenario could easily be where you had these every other, every row drippers right here, where you could have wider dripper spacing because you got more tape out there. You got more feet of tubing, so you can put the drippers wider. So maybe you can use a 5 8 or a 7 8 product diameter wise, where if you go to traditional, you might be using a 7 8 or a 1 inch because you got to put more drippers or higher flow. So you can see it kind of gets into the design thing. It's not, oh, you just cut half the cost out of it. It would traditionally be a less expensive system going with traditional or 3050 or skip or skip row plus in every row, but it's not cutting it in half. The drip tape is not um, half the cost. And also in the installation, if you're going through a field, plowing two versus plowing four really doesn't cost a whole lot more in, so far as the installation. So, you know, there, there's an economic piece to it, but it's not a you know, no brainer. I just cut half the price out of it. Yeah, so Michael, I just want to remind people that we do have the uh, chat open today, as well as the uh, Q&A. And uh, we're really getting some good technical information here. But if you need some clarifications or have some questions, put them in the chat box or put them in the Q&A. And I'll, be, I'll do my best to uh, ask Michael those questions. Right. And like a lot of things in this in this report, uh, the devil's in the details, right? You can't, we're going to talk kind of how these conclusions from an from a overall report standpoint um, but, you know, we, we definitely, you know, there's opportunities to dive in and see how, how a specific application work. And so, um, you know, I, I think that 
Um, yeah, so, so to describe how they did this, they had five year, five year, um, five years they ran this test. They did all five of these planning scenarios that we uh, strategies that we showed above, and they planted early in May and tried to do late in May. Some of it, you know, kind of snuck into June, but they kind of did early planting and the late planting. If you remember their hypothesis is that can we plant early kind of at the optimal plant development time versus waiting for the rain and can, can we beat it? So we just really should we focus on the plant development time. And so what, what happened? We did this five years, planted early, planted late, all five of these scenarios, what happened? And um, the first thing is that uh, the germination, uh, germination, which is kind of what the, the crux of the, of the whole study is, can this better germination lead to better yields, right? And how, how do we do that? Um, the late plantings into May did better than the early. And, and that makes some logical sense when we looked at the other, other um, uh, graphs is that it's typically warmer and wetter. Warmer, wetter helps germination, right? And so that makes logical sense. Um, that kind of agrees with what we would think. And also the closer to the dripper, the better. Again, makes more sense, right? The kind of the, the outlier there is the skip row because it's close, but you know, you don't have that, that extra row in between it. So their germination late rates were lower, but obviously a lot more, a lot less was put out in the, in the field. So later, better, closer, better. Okay. That makes some pretty good sense. But what are we really talking about? We want more cotton, right? That's what we're really trying to do. Um, so what happened? The early plantings beat the late plantings. And so that kind of a you know, little little hint there is that, OK, maybe this hypothesis is going to play out. Right. Really focusing on the planting date from a crop maturity standpoint was more beneficial, at least when comparing strategy to strategy than planting late. So if you did traditional early versus traditional late, the yields are better on the early. If you did, you know, skip early, skip late, skip was better. The earlier beat the late from yield. And within those configurations, they, they correlated plant population to, to yield. So if the whatever scenario, whatever year, whatever strategy, if it was number one on the plant population, it was number one in the yield. Again, that, that makes a little bit of sense. Um, so what Mike, about the have, water conservation? Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, we have one question here. And uh, can you plant too close? Is there a such thing as being too close to the tape? Um, too close to the tape? Um, I think the biggest challenge there would be if you got it too, too far up to the surface, you could get surface, you know, um, too much surface water and kind of negate some of your benefits of the evaporation. We'll see some what we call chimney effect in some soil types where the water kind of puddles up and it kind of wants to run to the surface, which is a weird phenomenon, but we, you will see it. Um, so I would say that's the challenge. We want it just high enough that it gets to the surface to germinate, but in the, in, the, in the growing season, we want it down where those feeding roots are at. So we actually want it lower. And I would say that most stuff is at least 12 inches. They, Freddie Lamb up in Kansas State has done some research on different depths and playing with that and, and seeing where the, kind of the break point is. But I would say, you know, most of it's 12 to 18 inches seems to be about the sweet spot for most soils that I've seen. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, to kind of pull this into the water conservation side, you know, we could make a jillion bales of cotton a year, but if we used up the Ogallala water aquifer, that wouldn't be a good thing, right? And so we want to always keep our eye on the ball of growing the most we can per, per gallon of water. And there's really two ways they looked at this. One of them was kind of a irrigation efficiency calculation, which really what they did was they took irrigated acre, irrigated yield, dry land they had a they had a had a um uh a, a, an unirrigated block that they kind of benchmarked up of and they divided that by how many how much water they put down pre-plant and during the season so you got kind of this yield differential by divided by how many gallons you put down so it kind of gave you a, a yield or efficiency by, by a gallon and then to kind of i think take that really into an interesting place is more you know more helpful for the growers is they added a market price to that so they took this yield differential and put a sale price to it, and not just what 70 cents a pound was, but with a quality factor in there. So then you could kind of put an assess, you know, did we depreciate quality, even though we grew more? <clears throat> and that really, um, that really was an interesting calculation that they looked at. And in and, and those, um, the, really the, the um, every row was kind of the, the one that, that won most of those categories year over year. 
<clears throat> but there was a little bit of basis there. The bias there, not basis, bias. They 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 felt like in some of the like the skip and the skip row plus <clears throat> that you know if they didn't have quite as good a plant population, they they reading between the lines a little bit here was you you might have been throwing a little bit of good money after bad. Where if you had a skip row or a skip row plus and a dry year and you didn't have a whole lot of plant population, you might not just continue to irrigate, 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 irrigate because you knew you weren't really going to catch up. They didn't do that in their test. They wanted to keep everything consistent, and but I do appreciate that they noted this. So it probably overinflated the the poorer performing um, crops on those um, uh, poorly germinated years uh, because they irrigate them just like they were doing great, and so they probably pumped more water than you would really would in a in a in a real in a real life situation. Um, yeah, so so what what kind of is the is the the really the the take on here that I that I want to talk about and 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 really what they were trying to you know as they stated in the in the report is you know can can we uh, can we plan on top of of uh, those eighty inch centers and and get the same results that we do in our traditional methods and <clears throat> and averaged out early plant late plant five years not really uh, the traditional beat the skip and the skip row. Um, across those five years, and, and I think that's interesting to, you know, I think that's important not to, to present it that way, is because in a cotton, you know, if you're growing cotton in the high plains, you're probably going to grow it for a long period of time. It's not a permanent crop, but you're kind of settled into the infrastructure. It's not like you're going to put drip down this year and be like, ah, I'm going to do something else and pull it out next year, right? So you almost treat the financials like a long term, like you would in a permanent crop. So over a five year period of time, the traditional beat the skip and the skip plus. So they beat their trial, you know, if you will. Um, what they had done in 2011. Uh, the asterisk there is that, you know, if it was super hot, super dry, and you're running out of time, it, you might be a good steward to not, maybe not put so much, so many plants out there, just save a little bit of an input call. So, you know, it's not that it's not the option. It's just year over year, probably not the best plan. <clears throat> so one that I thought was super interesting was this 3050 spacing. I want to go back to the 3050, make sure we understand it. So, it's a traditional space, wide space, drip tape, but clustering those rows. Super interesting, right? Best of both worlds. So how did it perform? Um, it, it, it did better, but not a lot better. Um, so, you know, when compared to the traditional setting, um, about 3% increase in yield uh, over those five-year period of time. So you could definitely make the argument if it didn't cost you anything. If you already had your equipment, your drip tape was already planted on 80s. And all you had to do, your equipment would handle the, the row adjustment. Yeah, why not, right? Um, you know, there was one year, a dry year in 2018, that it really did well and outperformed uh, this traditional by about, you know, two or 300 pounds. So what they would consider significant. So it overperformed the traditional every year minorly. And then one year it kind of hit. So, hey, one out of five years, you make a little bit of money. Doesn't cost you a whole little bit, a lot of money. You already got your drip tape in on 80s might not be a bad idea for that kind of producer. Really what interests me is, is you know, as a drip manufacturer is, all right, should we put one on every row, right? Um, and, I, and I think the answer there is a lot more hazy. I think it's a, it's a maybe. Um, it, it, it does perform the best. I mean, if you look kind of in all metrics, all years, you know, it's going to be A or A2, you know, where it's either the best or insignificantly not the best, right? I mean, it's just right there at the top every year, year after year, every metric that they tested. <clears throat> so from that standpoint, it's probably a pretty good investment. You know, kind of in that 2018, it was number one again, right? It even beat the 3050. So, I mean, it, that dry year, it really, it really performed over the traditional by about 300 pounds. So uh, that's significant, but it does cost more. And in in season irrigation, there's a lot of conflicting data whether the every row outperforms the traditional. There's some studies that say yes, very significant. Some studies that say no, not significant, and some say it doesn't matter. And so is that turns seems to be more regional of how the in season irrigation performs on every row versus a wider traditional or 30-50. Um, but, uh, from a germination standpoint and kind of, you know, consistency standpoint, you can see that it pretty much is a high performer every year. <clears throat> this is really my anecdotal 
uh, conclusion here. You kind of got this good, better, best. You can see on all these studies, you know, that, that I read through this is that, you know, the, 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 ev the closer spaced, like every row, 30, 50 in the traditional, those all perform in the top three almost every year in every category. And so, I mean, the traditional, there's a lot of acres out there, a lot of cotton grown is obviously a good way of tackling your problem, converting from ever to drip irrigation. I think you make the argument that the 30, 50 might be slightly better. And if it doesn't cost you a whole lot, you might try some, right? Um, and I think that every row has proven out that it's probably the best. I think it's your decision as a grower whether that, that best is worth the cost that it takes to, to add that infrastructure. Because I do believe in general, it would cost a little bit more to do the every row versus one of the traditionals or the 50s. Um, and really our takeaway today is kind of wrapping up. I want to leave a little bit of time if they have some questions, but you know, where do we go get this data? The, the, de the devil is in the details, right? And I would challenge you to go find this report. Uh, my contact information is on the end. You definitely um, can contact the, the guys that were built, you know, made this report at ASABE and talk to them. I'm sure they have a tremendous amount of data and, and we really appreciate them doing this, but you can go grab the real uh, document um, on the ASABE website, go to the technical library tab, and then you can search. There's all kinds of stuff in there. And I think you can buy the individual reports for like 20 or 10 bucks, and then you can maybe pay and get a group of them. So search before you just buy this one. There could be a lot of good content that you want to get on that. And so, But that's where you grab this. You also can got, kind of uh, get the uh, abbreviated summary from the Irrigation Association, Irrigation Today, uh, fall 2020. So go to uh, irrigation.org, uh, down, you gotta scroll down a little bit and you can go to IA Publications, and then it takes you to Irrigation Today. You can look at archives and you can look at last, you know, the fall edition and previous ones, and it's in that fall edition. So you can get a lot of detail from there. Um, but, the, but the full report, you know, in support of our guys at the ASABE that's doing this, doing this research to help our industry, you know, uh, 10 bucks is, is not a whole lot to pay for some of these reports. There's a lot of good content in there. So support them if you can. Um, my contact information there at the end, um, or if we got a little bit of time, Richard, I'll leave that up to you. If you want to take a few questions, I'll do my best to answer them. Yes, one of them. Thank you, Michael. Great presentation. Uh, really learned a lot here, and I love uh, applying uh, science to what we do. Right? There's having somebody do a study for five years is so valuable to us. Right? So one of the things I think about uh, if I'm a grower is I want to strategize for when I have the worst years or toughest growing years because typically yields will be down, prices will be up, and those are the years I want to do the best. So thinking about that and thinking about this drip tape and the different uh, options, uh, do you still stay with your uh, good, better, best uh, scenarios? I do, and I think that's really where um, I think that's really where you, where we kind of settled on this every row, and why we see a lot of it is that if you don't get a good stand, if you don't get a good germination there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, my dad always said, you know, we had, we had old worn out trucks and old worn out combines, but our planting equipment was brand new and serviced to the max. Because if you don't get that good stand, you're fighting it all year long. And you can throw everything you've got at it from an agronomy standpoint, but you got to get a good stand. And I do believe that that's why a lot of people have decided on the, uh, on the every row. And, and some people that are more, you know, engaged and been in that industry longer probably have more information on kind of where that migrated, why we changed from that 80s to those 40-inch spacings. But um, from what I can see in this data, uh, you can definitely see that it year over year is the highest performing from a germination and a yield. And if we can get, like you said, if we if we hit one of those 2011s where price was at two bucks, you're paid, right? You're 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 you paid for that that pricing differential and that's probably the biggest barrier is do i need to spend that extra money it, and that's whatever we would do you know buy whatever we're buying houses cars whatever phones <clears throat> where 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 is enough enough and when do i need to upgrade um but i think you know in a five-year study you know it, it it showed that there was one year that definitely paid for it and so um I, I think so right i think that that probably is the safest bet and, uh, but I would encourage people to look at it both ways. And a lot of our designers or our dealers do, they, they look at both ways so you can lay that out and make that decision from a financial standpoint, what kind of risk you're willing to take. Yeah, so, right. So and I think about it and I say, well, on the years where the weather's good and the rain's good, well, I'm gonna be good and I'm gonna stay with everybody. And maybe some of my other techniques uh, are gonna help me have better yields. Uh, but that's not going to be a great year for anybody or, you know, because because uh, everybody's having a good year. 
So the time I can make the best uh, money for myself and my family is going to be on those uh, tough years. So I, I, I'm all for the insurance. <laughs> Yeah, if it rains every day, we don't need a drip irrigation system, right? And but that but that's what we're saying. We're we're not. We know it's not going to rain. It's just it's just a matter of where that financial uh, piece falls for you. And some of it might come into you know, are you leasing? Are you owning the land? Or you know, how far? You know, how how many years you've got left to farm? You know, or or what what how you want your land valuated uh, if you do get ready to sell it? You know, so so all the, there's a lot that goes into those those um, decisions. And I think that's, I think, like I said, I, I believe that a majority of what we're seeing now, or at least I'm seeing now is on that 40, you know, every row spacing. Yeah. So was the um, emitter spacing evaluated too? Not in this study. Um, they went with pretty, bre they actually went with a pretty high end pressure compensating product. And I'm, I'm guessing what they did that for is they wanted to take out any kind of variables within the row, it would not be a traditional product that you used in this climate, uh, this region, just because you don't need it is relatively flat, but, but there are some areas uh, uh, that, that have some really low spots. So it's not uncommon, uh, not unheard of, I guess you'd say to use a PC product in, in this area, but generally not. Um, generally they're using a non-PC, but they did not evaluate the spacing down the road. It's, it's really more of a, how, how wide can I space it with my flow rate to make sure I get my one, most of it's deficit irrigated. So your, your pump is really what's driving the emitter selection and spacing more than, uh, you know, the, the, the plant itself. Right. So, all right. Well, Michael, again, thank you so much. This information was really fascinating. And I know uh, not just the cotton growers, but everybody appreciates it because uh, it makes us think more about what we're doing uh, in, in our own crops too, if it's not cotton. So uh, thanks very much. And to those of you watching today, thank you very much. We really appreciate your time and your interest in what we're doing here. Um, and if you've got some suggestions for subjects, you can reach out to Michael or myself and uh, we'll be happy to uh, uh, put them into our segments in the future. So Michael, thanks again. And thanks everybody. And remember uh, we're on uh, Apple, Google uh, podcast, as well as all our trainings are on our website under irrigation training. And uh, Friday, we're going to be back. We've got the two founders of My Job Depends on Ag that are going to be joining us and taking us through this journey of uh, something that really uh, I consider viral in the social media area for uh, agriculture, this whole uh, My Job Depends on Ag uh, uh, movement. So anyway, that'll be Friday. I hope to see everybody there. Thanks again, uh, Michael, and thanks to all of you. We'll see you now. Appreciate it, Richard.